All right, this is part two of our series on Levi. In part one, we covered the Levites during the time of Moses. In part two, we're going to cover the Levites from the time of Joshua, leading them into the promised land, until the end of the kings, or the destruction of the temple in 586 B.C., which would be the end of the first temple period in Israel's history. Now, we're not going to talk about the actual destruction of the temple, but just the end of the line of kings. So, the first thing we're going to start with is Joshua. As I mentioned in part one, I think I misspoke when I said Yeshua is the Greek way to say Joshua. Yeshua is actually the proper Hebrew way to say Joshua. Yesu is the Greek way to say Joshua. Jesus is the English way to say it. So it's all the same name. Jesus, Joshua, Yesu, Yeshua. Okay, these events uh, are spoken of in the book of Joshua chapter 3, um, where the Levites carry the ark into the river Jordan. And as soon as they touch the water, the river stops flowing and it bunches up like a wall at the, on the upstream side and it just flows dry on the downstream side. And this was in the fall time during the highest part of the river. So Joshua commanded the people to keep 2,000 cubits back away from the ark. They weren't allowed to go any closer than that. And God told Joshua that I'm going to do this miracle that the people may know that I am with you just the same way that I was with Moses. And Joshua told the people that God is doing this to show you that God is with you and that he will drive out your enemies before you. So when the priests went into the to block the river and the children of Israel crossed over, Joshua chose one man out of each tribe who were to grab each one a stone out of the bed of the river. And they took the 12 stones and they made a, a monument on the west side of the Jordan and that their children's children would know that that monument was there because the Lord stopped the Jordan River from flowing so that the children of Israel could cross over. So after they finished crossing the river, the city of Jericho was a huge fortress, and that was the very that was the biggest fortress in the land of Canaan, and that was the first city they attacked. And this is recorded in Joshua chapter 6. And the way they did this was the men that marched around the walls of the city once a day for 7 days. And on the seventh day, the priests carrying the ark and other priests, Levites, with trumpets went ahead of them. And they marched around in front of the men and they marched around the city seven times on the seventh day. And on the seventh time around, after they finished, then they blew the trumpets and all the men shouted, and the city walls of Jericho fell. And then they invaded the city by running in over the broken walls. This is an important um, clue to understanding the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to point out some clues of, of the Revelation as we go along, because there's quite a few of them in this study about the Levites. Um, the way that this is related is that in the in the book of Revelation, you have seven the the Lamb at the throne of God receives a scroll with seven seals, 
and he opens the seven seals and the seventh seal is seven trumpets and then the trumpets blow and each trumpet has an event that happens the seventh trumpet is seven vials and the seven vials are poured out upon the earth so in the same way um, we see this in the book of Joshua with they marched once a day for seven days and on the seventh day they marched around it seven times and Jericho was like the fortress of evil the, the greatest fortress of evil and this is how they overcame the fortress of evil I did a video uh, the history of God chapter 17 part 3 I'll post a link right here to it um, where it talks about Eli the priest um, when when the people went across the Jordan they 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 overthrew the city of Jericho and they eventually moved into the land and the tent of meeting which the Levites controlled the tent the sanctuary ended up in a place called Shiloh which is in a, about the middle of Israel up on top of this mountain in Shiloh and it stood there for oh, a few hundred years that was the tent and uh, the place where the ark was kept and Eli was uh, the last priest um, in that place before Samuel the prophet um, Samuel the prophet was trained by Eli and Samuel the prophet anointed David and the 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 sanctuary the tent of meeting was replaced by the temple so Eli is sort of sh shown as the last Levite priest in the tent of meeting and he had two sons that were very greedy and they were taking bribes and they were in charge of the sacrifices and they kept taking lots of meat for themselves and their friends and they were um, treating the sacrifices of Israel with uh, a lot of disrespect and, and just using it for greed for themselves and it was causing a lot of people uh, a lot of troubles in Israel uh, over them uh, taking too much money taking too much meat and, and being very greedy and God uh, eventually judged Eli for not uh, for putting his sons above God and the the verse that I want to take away from all of that about Eli is what God said to Eli uh, during the time that he judged him it's in first Samuel chapter 2 verse 29 it says, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honor your sons above me to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. The house of his father was Aaron. But now the Lord says, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And then, he, then God uh, prophesied to him that his, both his sons would die on one day. What happened was that the Philistines were attacking Israel from the south, and they wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant to go ahead of their army so they would win and so they sent they said go get the ark of the covenant and eli's two sons brought the ark of the covenant into battle and they lost and the philistines actually took the ark of the covenant and they 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 possessed the ark for about i think it was about five months and 
that was the uh, when the, the Philistines were being cursed by the ark and they finally sent it back to Israel so and then the ark stood um, in another town it didn't go back to the tent of meeting it stood in another town for many years until it was moved into Jerusalem by David so that is another uh, story of Levi where Eli actually brought down um, the, the family of Aaron very much by losing the ark and, and disrespecting the office of the priesthood. And that was the last of the, uh, the last time the ark was in the tent of the, in Shiloh. Now, we'll skip ahead to First Chronicles chapter 15. Now we're skipping ahead to King David. And we're going to read about King David bringing the ark into Jerusalem. So the ark was being kept in a, in a town and just sort of put on a shelf. Everyone was afraid of it. And the tent of meeting, I don't, I don't even know what was going on with that in Shiloh. Um, but it, there was no ark there. So it sort of takes away the whole, um, the ark was the mercy seat that nobody except the high priest was supposed to look at once a year. And that was like the mercy seat of God. So what is the tent or the tabernacle without a mercy seat? So, you know, everything was a kind of disarray since Eli's time. Now, the prophet Samuel, who was raised since he was a child by Eli, and he knew the priesthood, and he was uh, filled the office of the high priest, and he was also a prophet. He anointed Saul as king, and then he also anointed David as king. And so we skip by Saul and all of that. And now we're at where David is the king. Okay. First Chronicles chapter 15. And David made houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them has the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister to him forever. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. And David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites. Okay, it goes through the numbers of them. And then down in verse, verse 12, And David said to them, You are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves both you and your brothers, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. For because you did it not at first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after due order. So he's saying we screwed everything, everything's been screwed up, right? So now we're going to fix it. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord of God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. And David spoke to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brothers to be the singers with instruments of music, psalteries and harps and cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So the Levites are, are now become musicians. And um, you recognize the name Asaph in the Psalms. Uh, the Psalms were, um, most of them were written by David, and a bunch of the Psalms were written by Asaph. So he was in charge of the singers. Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the cornet 
and with trumpets and cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. You see here where David now, he's saying, okay, there's been a breach, and the ark is not where it's supposed to be. And David is preparing to build a temple. Now he's made the Levites the guardians of the ark. And he's made them singers and musicians to sing praises to the Lord. Now we covered this in a different video already, but I'm going to quickly cover it again. And you'll find it in 1 Chronicles chapter 17. And it's God's covenant with David. And basically what happened is that David said to Nathan the, the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord remains under curtains, or in a tent. And Nathan said to David, Do all is in your heart. God is with you. And then that night, God appeared to Nathan in a dream and gave him a prophecy for David. This is a very key prophecy in the whole Bible. I'll read it out to you. Um, where God tells Nathan the prophet, Go and tell David my servant, thus says the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up Israel unto this day, but have gone from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another. Wheresoever I have walked with all Israel, did I speak a word to any of the judges of Israel who I commanded to feed my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedars? Now therefore thus you shall say unto my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheep coat, even from following the sheep, that you should be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wheresoever you have walked, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a name like a name of the great men that are in the earth. And also I will ordain a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and they shall dwell in their place, and shall be moved no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness waste them any more, as at the beginning and since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. Moreover, I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house. And it shall come to pass, when your days are expired, that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will raise up your seed after you, which shall be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. And I will not take my mercy away from him, as I took it from him that was before you. But I will settle him in my house, and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forevermore. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak to David. So this is uh, this changes the history of Israel. This this prophecy from God to David, that his son shall be established on the throne forever over Israel. And this um, has been a dream of Judah ever since then. Um, th this is speaking of what is known as the Messiah uh, who will come and rule from Jerusalem and rule over the entire earth forever. So David didn't, um, he wasn't given permission to build the house for God. But David gathered all the materials for his son to build the house for God. And he spent the entire rest of his life gathering huge cedars and huge stones and all kinds of copper and brass and iron and just kept making a huge store of it 
for the temple to be built. And he also made um, plans for the temple and he had everything ready to go. And when his son Solomon took the throne, Solomon built the temple and that's the first temple. That's the temple that was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in 586 BC. Okay, now in 1 Chronicles chapter 23, this is after David is old now. He's, he's gathered all the material to build the temple, but Solomon, his son, is the one who is actually going to erect the temple. So this is David giving instructions to Solomon his, before he dies. So when David was old and full of days, he made Solomon, his son, king over Israel. And he gathered together all the princes of Israel with the priests and the Levites. Now the Levites were numbered from the age of 30 years and up, and their number by their poles, man by man, was 38,000, of which 24,000 were to set forward the work of the house of the Lord, and 6,000 were officers and judges. Moreover, 4,000 were porters, and 4,000 praised the Lord, with the instruments which I made, said David, to praise therewith. Porters are like doorkeepers. First Chronicles, same chapter, 23, we'll move up to verse 24. These were the sons of Levi after the house of their fathers, even the chief of the fathers, as they were counted by number of names by their poles, that did the work for the service of the house of the Lord from the age of 30 years and upward. For David said, The Lord God of Israel has given rest to his people that they may dwell in Jerusalem forever. And also to the Levites, they shall no more carry the tabernacle, nor any vessels of it for the service thereof. For by the last words of David, the Levites were numbered from twenty years old and above, because their office was to wait on the sons of Aaron for the service of the house of the Lord in the courts and in the chambers and in the purifying of all the holy things and the work of the service of the house of God. So you see what David did. He built the temple and he said, well, since the priests are no longer going to carry the ark or the vessels, uh, their job has changed. They're to take care of the temple and... Uh, the other Levites are to take care of them. So David modified the whole system of the Levitical priesthood, um, uh, adding the musicians and putting it in a fixed place instead of a tent that moves around. Okay, so after David's death, the temple was built, the ark was brought in, there was a great ceremony uh, with Solomon and uh, great prophecies and, and great speeches, all um, dedicating the new temple. And the glory of God filled the temple, and God sanctified that temple. So from that point, everything was fine, everything was beautiful, and it was a new system that David had set up around surrounding the fixed temple so god approved all of this and it was all perfect on that day when they uh, sanctified the temple and god actually moved into it now second chronicles chapter 11 verse 14 to 17 now this is about jeroboam um I spoke about it before, but I'll quickly explain. When Solomon died, um, because Solomon had sinned he, he, uh, very greatly against Israel, he married many foreign wives from the kingdoms all around him, and he started to bring their gods into Israel, and he worshipped their gods. He set up temples and... and uh, sanctuaries or idols to their gods to please his wives and 
they began mingling these foreign religions in with Israel's religion. So God um, split the kingdom in two. And he took uh, Jeroboam, who was Solomon's general, and turned him against him in, rebell in rebellion. And he took the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes. And Rehoboam was a son of Solomon. He ended up ruling in Jerusalem over Judah. So I'll read a little bit from this now about Jeroboam. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem because Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And he ordained him himself priests for the high places and for the devils and the calves which, we, which he had made because he set up the two golden calves in northern Israel. So he set up his own priesthood out of other people to take care of the golden calves and all the devils. Basically what happened when, when Jeroboam set up the golden calves, all the people who, uh, there was a polarization, all the Levites were kicked out, they moved to Jerusalem. And all the people who wanted to stay with David's God moved, gravitated towards Jerusalem. Okay, in Second Chronicles chapter 13, Abijah and Jeroboam go to war. Abijah had um, 400,000 men of war and Jeroboam had 800,000 men of war. And Abijah, they, they met near this mountain and Abijah gets up on the mountain and he gives a speech to all, the, all of Israel and Judah. And I'll just quickly read his speech. And he said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam and all Israel. Ought you to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and has rebelled against his Lord. And there are gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tender-hearted and could not withstand them. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, and you be a great multitude. And there are you with golden calves, which Jeroboam made you for gods. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and have made you priests after the manner of the nations of other lands, so that whatsoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest of them that are not gods? But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him, and the priests which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites wait upon their business. And they burn unto the Lord every morning and every evening burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. The showbread also set they in order upon a pure table, and the candlestick of gold with the lamps thereof to burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. And behold, God himself is with us for our captain, and his priests with surrounding trumpets to cry alarm against you, O children of Israel. Fight you not against the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. So as Abijah was speaking, Jeroboam sent men around behind him to flank him from behind. And when they looked and they saw that they were surrounded, there was army in front of them and an army behind them. 
So then the, he commanded the priest, and they blew the trumpets, and God broke out upon Jeroboam's army, and they started to die, and the men of Judah rushed upon them and started killing them, and there was a great slaughter of 500,000 of Jeroboam's men. Abijah gained territory on that battle, all the way to Bethel and uh, took cities out, out of the northern kingdom. On this map, it's a German map, you'll see Bethel is named Bethel. That's Bethel. Here we see another example of the priests blowing the trumpets ahead of the battle, leading into war. Now recorded in Second Chronicles chapter 17, we see Jehoshaphat is two kings after Abijah and of the house of David. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of his father David and did not serve the idols. And he had the idols removed from all of Judah, and he sent the Levites around to all the cities of Judah to teach the law of Moses to the people. So this was another job of the Levites, to teach the law to the people. In Second Chronicles chapter 19, Jehoshaphat set up judges from the Levites in every city of Judah, and he charged them not to take bribes and not to be respecters of persons and to judge the people with a pure heart in the fear of the Lord. He also set up a higher court in Jerusalem for the more controversial cases, and he charged those judges in the same manner. And he divided his government into two divisions. Uh, one division was under the leadership of the Prince of Judah, which was for the uh, regular secular government matters. And the other division of government was under the charge of the high priest and the Levites and the judges and the things of God. So now the Levites are like a division of government in Judah. Okay, in Second Chronicles chapter 20, a great army forms in the east against Jehoshaphat. It's Ammon, Moab, and Edom. And it also says a great army from beyond the sea were gathered there with them. And Jehoshaphat was in, was in great fear. And so he went and he called a fast in all of Judah. And all the people came and gathered in Jerusalem. And Jehoshaphat stood before the temple. And he gave a great uh, prayer, a great speech and a prayer before God. I'll read the prayer here. You'll find it in Second Chronicles chapter 20. And Jehoshaphat said, O Lord God of our fathers, are not you God in heaven? And rule not you over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? Are not you our God who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwelt therein and have built you a sanctuary therein for your name, saying, If when evil comes upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in your presence, for your name is in this house, and cry unto you in our affliction, then you will hear and help. And now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. 
Then upon Jehaziel, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken you, all Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, Be not afraid or dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. So in the morning they marched out, and in the, at the head of the army that was marching out, um, the priests and the Levites were at the head of the army singing. And they were singing the praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And when they got to the battle, all the other, all the enemy were laying there dead already. There was nothing to do. And they started spoiling the enemy. They started to take all the jewels and all the, the possessions that were among them. And there was so much stuff. It took three days to gather everything. And then they brought it all back to Jerusalem and rejoiced. And uh, as it says, the Lord caused them to rejoice over their enemies. So in this example, there's the Levites as a prophet. A Le Levite was made into a prophet to answer um, Jehoshaphat. And the Levites were also uh, to sing songs going out to watch this battle. Okay, Second Chronicles chapter 23. Now, just as a recap, um, Athaliah was a queen in Judah. Or Athaliah, maybe? Athaliah. And she was a, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, who the son of Jehoshaphat married. And the son's name was Jehoram, and he married Athaliah. Or Athaliah. Ahab and Jezebel were the ones who brought Baal worship into the northern kingdom of Israel. When Jehoram died, his son Ahaziah became the king. But when Ahaziah was killed by Jehu, who was the um, the captain of Israel who, who took over in a coup and he uh, slaughtered all the family of Ahab but he ended up slaughtering the king of Judah also because he was the son of this daughter this the daughter of Ahab but he was actually the king of Judah so when he died his mother became the sole reigning queen of Judah and what she did was she turned against the entire royal family of David and slaughtered all of them except for the one who was uh, taken and saved and hidden from her. He was the young one. His name was Jehoash. Okay, we're going to read a little bit about what happened with the Jehoash. So Jehoiada the priest had taken Jehoash and hid him in the temple for six years. He was one year old when they, when they rescued him. He then gathered all the Levites out of Judah and made a pact with them all, that they would all help guard the, king's, the boy king in the temple, and they kept him hidden there for six years. When Jehoash became seven years old, then they decided to make him king. And they had uh, a lot of spears and shields in the temple that were kept there that used to belong to David. And they handed out the spears and shields. And then they brought Jehoash out and put a crown on him in front of all the people 
and crowned him king. And when they did that, then all the people started shouting, God save the king. And when Athaliah heard the shouting and all the commotion, she came running into the temple. And when she saw Jehoash with the crown on and all the people shouting, then she cried, treason, treason. And they grabbed her and they dragged her out of the gate and killed her. Jehoiada then made a covenant with all the priests and all the people that they should consecrate themselves and serve only God. And so then they went over and they destroyed the temple of Baal and killed the priests of Baal. Because Athaliah and her husband, Jeroham, had set up this temple to Baal in Jerusalem and had forced Baal worship upon, Jeru on, upon Judah. So they turned all that around and destroyed the temple of Baal and they killed the priests of Baal in front of the altar of Baal. So there's another job of the Levites. They were like the spy agency of the king. They were, um, they, they took the charge upon themselves to protect the seed of David, the royal, the royal blood of, of Judah. So they, they set up some, something like a spy agency and, and they uh, overthrew that wicked queen and they caused a coup. So there's another function of the Levites. Now, recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, Jehoash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years in Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and served in the ways of his father David because he was raised by the priests for his whole life until then. And then he um, commanded the Levites to cleanse the temple and to repair the temple because it had been pretty badly broken down. And the doors of it were shut up. And so they didn't have any money. And so they made this big box, this big chest. And they set it outside the temple by the gate and people would just put money in there. They First they went around and took up a collection through all of Judah, and they got a big lot of money from that. And then they, they put this box out by the gate, and people would just give as they could. Because I suppose the people were having a hard time too. So they hired uh, masons and carpenters and brass workers and iron workers and they began fixing the temple so this was like a, a charity foundation set up um, and that box also appeared even that custom continued even until the time of jesus um, when Jesus was sitting outside the temple teaching his disciples and the, the, the people were putting money in the box as they went into the temple. It's found in Luke chapter 21, verse 1 to 4. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. This is the box in front of the temple. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say to you that this poor widow has cast in more than all of them. For all of them have of their abundance cast in to the offerings of God. But she of her punery has cast in all the living that she had. After the time of Jehoash, Judah fell away from God again. Um, during the days of Uzziah, Uzziah was the king who decided to go into the temple and offer incense 
and God struck him with leprosy. So he spent the rest of his days in seclusion because he was leprous. And that was the first king that the prophet Isaiah began to to become a prophet under. And he uh, Isaiah was a prophet from the time of Uzziah until the time of Hezekiah and all the kings in between. He he dealt with all of those kings. From the time of Uzziah and Ahaz, they had made treaties with the king of Damascus and had taken on their religion. And they started modifying the temple into other gods and and started mixing the religion again. And it just got worse and worse up until the time of Hezekiah. It was during the reign of Ahaz that Tiglath-Pileser III, the king of Assyria, invaded the northern kingdom and took them into captivity. And he also invaded the entire west coast along the Levant, even taking the Philistines into captivity. That was the end of the Philistines. And eventually they became an Assyrian province. And it was only the kingdom of Judah during the reign of Hezekiah. The only thing left was the kingdom of Judah. And it was basically surrounded by Assyria. Second Chronicles chapter 29. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And, and his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street. And he said to them, Hear me, you Levites. Sanctify now yourselves and the sanctify the house of the Lord, God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. Also they have shut up the doors of the porch, and put out the lamps, and have not burned incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he has delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as you see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord God has chosen you to stand before him to serve him and that you should minister to him and burn incense. Then the Levites arose. Names off uh, the sons of the Levites. Um, bah, 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 bah. And they gathered their brothers and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. And they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kidron. Now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord, so they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. Then they went into Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof, and the showbread table with all the vessels thereof. Moreover, 
All the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression, we have prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. Then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bullocks and seven rams and seven lambs and seven he goats for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary and for Judah. And he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they killed the bullocks, and the priests received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, when they had killed the rams, they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They killed also the lambs, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And they brought forth the he goats for the sin offering before the king and the congregation, and they laid their hands upon them. And the priests killed them, and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalteries and harps, according to the commandment of David, and of Gad the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. For so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, the king of Israel. And all the congregation worshipped and the singer sang and the trumpeter sounded and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had made an end of offering, the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. That's the Psalms. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed their heads and worshipped. And Hezekiah answered and said, Now you have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, and as many as were of a free heart burnt offerings. And the number of burnt offerings which the congregation brought was threescore and ten bullocks, that's uh, seventy, a hundred rams and two hundred lambs, and these were for the burnt offering of the Lord. And the consecrated things were six hundred oxen and three thousand sheep. But the priests were too few, so that they could not flay all the burnt offerings, wherefore their brethren, the Levites, did help them till the work was ended, and until the other priests had sanctified themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. And also the burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. And Hezekiah rejoiced and all the people that God had prepared the people for the thing was done suddenly. We're going to read chapter 32 because this is important. This is Hezekiah's reformation of the whole system. <clears throat> and Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that is the northern kingdom and on the east side of the Jordan, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes, and all the congregation in Jerusalem, to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at the time, because the priests had not sanctified themselves su sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established the decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord, the God of Israel, at Jerusalem. For they had not done it in a long time, 
in such sort as it was written. So the posts went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, and according to all the commandment of the king, saying, You children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. And be not you like your fathers and like your brothers, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you see. Because by the time Hezekiah was king, the northern kingdom had already been destroyed by Assyria, and only only Judah was left. Now be you not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you turn again to the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. So the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, diverse people of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great congregation. And they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem and all the altars for incense. They took away and cast them into the brook Kidron. Then they killed the Passover on the fourteenth day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passover for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Ishakar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves. Yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, the good Lord pardon everyone that prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests Praise the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. And Hezekiah spoke comfortably to all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. And the whole assembly took counsel to keep another seven days, that they kept another seven days with gladness. For Hezekiah, king of Judah, did give to the congregation a thousand bullocks and seven thousand sheep, and the princes gave to the congregation a thousand bullocks and ten thousand sheep, and a great number of priests sanctified themselves. And all the congregation of Judah with the priests and the Levites and all the congregation that came out of Israel and the strangers that came out of the land of Israel so these were probably Samaritans, people who were brought in there by Assyria, and that dwelt in Judah, they all rejoiced. So there was a great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, 
there was not the like in Jerusalem. Then the priests, the Levites, arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even to heaven. Now when all this was finished, all Israel that were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke the images in pieces and cut down the groves and threw down the high places and the altars out of all Judah and Benjamin, in Ephraim also and in Manasseh, until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned, every man to his possession, into their own cities." Uh, during the reign of Hezekiah, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, after Tiglath-Pileser III, he took all the cities of Judah also. And all the people of Judah were went into the city of Jerusalem and they were besieged inside the city. And Hezekiah was inside the city with all the people and Assyria was controlling basically all the land except for the city of Jerusalem. And Hezekiah prayed to God before the temple and that's when the Assyrian army was killed by angels. 85,000 of them were slain in the middle of the night and then they went back to Assyria and left. In the end of his reign, Hezekiah received envoys from Babylon. This was probably during the rule of Merodach Baladin. During the Assyrian Empire, there were a few times when um, Babylon revolted and became a kingdom. But it was only a small kingdom. And they sent envoys to see Hezekiah and Hezekiah showed them everything he had and he was bragging about everything he had. And the, Isaiah told him that was a big mistake because one day they're going to come and take everything he has. Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, he shut up the temple and reinstated Baal worship in Israel. But Manasseh's grandson, Josiah, reopened the temple and began working on restoring it after he had destroyed all the idols. The priests found the book of the law of Moses in the temple and Josiah had everyone gather in Jerusalem and the priests read the book to them. He also held the great Passover. So after all of this, during the days of Jehoiachin, at the very end of the line of David, um, Nebuchadnezzar came in 597 BC and invaded Judah, um, invaded Jerusalem, and they didn't destroy the city, but they he set up a puppet king named Zedekiah. He was one of the sons of Josiah, but um, Nebuchadnezzar set him up as a loyal puppet king and took Jehoiachin captive. And then eventually Zedekiah revolted against Nebuchadnezzar 10 years later in 586 BC. And so Nebuchadnezzar came back and that's when he destroyed Jerusalem and took all the people captive back to Babylon. And there were prophecies, mainly by Isaiah, saying that they would be taken to Babylon for 70 years and then brought back. So the prophets had told them it was only a temporary captivity and, and they were all hanging on to these prophecies from that time on in Babylon. So we'll conclude this video here and we'll start uh, in part three. We're going to take a, l a little look at the prophecies. I'll see you then.